This is Professor Lynn Porter from Fairfield University, and this is my lecture on the genre tragedy. As we unpack these various ideas of genre, tragedy, comedy, domestic drama, and melodrama, I want to point out that all of the stuff from dramatic structure applies here. You have protagonist inciting incident, major dramatic question, rising action, climax. You have all of that stuff that we talked about in terms of dramatic structure and plot structure. But genre gets to the question of the overall effect we want to have on our audience. When we talk about the concept of genre, that's just kind of a big catch-all word that basically means a category. So we have four different categories that we're going to be unpacking here in this class. We'll start with tragedy. And I like to say this up front. Typically in intro classes, we start by looking at the concept of tragedy, which seems to mean that tragedy is the most important genre or somehow it's special. And that's not true. Tragedy and comedy are actually two sides of the same coin. They absolutely grew up together. And as soon as we see the development of tragedy in any culture, you also see the development of comedy. So they're not, they are very distinct things, of course, tragedy and comedy, but one is not more important or better than the other. They're just two very different things, two sides of the same coin. So in this lecture on tragedy, I want to put the information into two major buckets. The first one is the effect of tragedy on the audience. And the second one is how a tragedy is structured. So I'll call that the recipe, a recipe for tragedy. Sounds like a movie trailer, doesn't it? So let's start by examining how tragedy works on us when we as audience members see a tragedy. And I think most of these ideas are encapsulated in the article entitled Tragedy, a Curious Art Form. This is actually the preface to a book by Anne Carson called grief lessons. I came across this book in a bookstore and I saw it laying on a table and from 10 feet away I could see the title of the book is grief lessons and I thought what a curious title for a book. What is that book possibly about? Who needs lessons in grieving? How curious. And then I picked it up and it's actually a series of new translations and adaptations of some of Euripides tragedies. So, and being a curious book buyer, I flipped open the book Grief Lessons and I read the preface. And this is the preface from the book called Tragedy, a Curious Art Form. In this reading, we come across some rather interesting ideas. First, we have the idea that we as humans are full of rage, but the rage is not unfounded. We have rage that is born of our griefs. We have so much grieving in our lives that we actually have this internal rage all the time. And while we may feel like we've had some closure after an event that is grievous, Actually, that's not true. We tend to psychologically just box up our grief and store it away in our heart and try really hard not to go near that box. But that doesn't mean the box isn't there. We still have that grief packaged up waiting inside of us. And so having that grief inside of us leads to our having rage inside of us. So what are we going to do about that? Ann Carson makes the analogy to the idea of headhunters, that in the act of cutting off a human head and discarding it, a headhunter 
throws away that rage, all of that anger coming from the grief. Somehow in this act of human sacrifice, we are able to purge some of that anger and relieve some of the pressure of our griefs. Let's be honest, this sounds pretty weird, doesn't it? How many of us feel like headhunters? Here we see what Carson means by that metaphor of the headhunter. Tragedy does exactly the same thing as a headhunter cutting off a head and throwing it away. But bonus, nobody has to die in the process. And that's a good thing, right? We don't want other people to have to die in order for us to somehow get rid of those feelings of anger and rage and grief. But there is a cost. And here I do want to go back to that idea of human sacrifice. This sounds weird, so stay with me. When we think about the idea of sacrifice, what do we mean? We mean one human being who goes through some kind of a negative experience for the sake of someone else. Isn't that what we mean by sacrifice? Doing good for others, and in the process, it may very well not be good for us. So that's exactly what happens on stage. Our tragic actor goes through the journey of our tragic protagonist and feels all of those feelings, and we get to experience that journey, but we didn't have to die, and an actor didn't have to die, but the tragic actor is still sacrificing some of, of their personal well-being in this process. I'm going to say that again. Tragedy is an act of human sacrifice where the tragic actor sacrifices his or her personal comfort for the sake of the audience having a positive effect on the other end of the play. It's weird, I know. Moving along to our next article, Sadness Breathes Gratitude. Tragedies have a way of working on our memories. In fact, when we're watching tragedies, we tend to think of people we know, relationships we have. We tend to think of the important people in our lives. So tragedies remind us of those really important people. You can walk out of a tragedy and, and feel like, wow, I need to call my dad. I need to reach out to my mom. I haven't talked to her in a while. Tragedies bring those relationships up to the surface of our minds. And not only do we think of the important people in our lives, we're also grateful for them. We're thankful for them. We think of those relationships and we are reminded by the tragedy of how important they are to us. It sounds weird, doesn't it? But those emotions that come up for us when we're watching a tragedy make us think seriously about our own lives. So by witnessing a tragedy and seeing the sacrifice and the pain and the suffering that the characters go through, we're reminded of everything good and wonderful and marvelous in our own lives. We're reminded of the wonderful people in our lives. It is curious, isn't it? It seems exactly backwards. This is another one of those paradoxes of theater. Tragedies make us feel really good. It's weird, isn't it? But true. Up to this point, I've been talking about the effect that tragedy has on us as audience members when we see tragedy. Now I want to move along to the work the playwright does to get all of those pieces in the right place so the plays have those. This is what I call the recipe for tragedy. 
And I want to point out that in everyday life, we use the word tragedy, don't we? We talk about that hurricane hitting the coast, and we talk about the tragedy of people in, in horrible circumstances. We talk about bad things happening to good people. But that's not what we're talking about here. I am unpacking a rich definition of tragedy as a very specific form of dramatic literature. And I hope by the end of this lecture, you will see how tragedy is so much more than bad things happening to good people. I'm going to break this information down into these four categories. And I'm going to do this with all four genres that we're talking about in this class. By the end of these lectures, you'll be able to com directly compare these different elements of the genres. So let's first look at the distinguishing characters you find in a tragedy. Tragedies have a very special character, the tragic protagonist. You may have also heard the term tragic hero that means the same thing. In a tragedy, all of the action is centered around what's going on with this single character. And I need to point this out. Everything we know about the term protagonist, that central driving character in a play, fits here. So a tragic protagonist is just a special form of protagonist. So let's dig into that. What makes a tragic protagonist a tragic protagonist? Part of it has to do with the social status of our protagonist. And here is where we start to see there's two different forms of tragedy. Traditional tragedy, or some people call it classical tragedy, or modern tragedy, which came about much, much later in the history of dramatic literature. So in a traditional tragedy, your protagonist is of noble birth. And what does that mean? Generally, that means the protagonist is of royalty, nobility, a lord or lady, a king, queen, that is the kind of nobility we're talking about here. In modern tragedies, we have protagonists who are centered very much in the middle class. Thank you very much, Arthur Miller and Death of a Salesman, for starting off that trend. But this is the important part. Whatever the social class the protagonist is born into, the protagonist is one of the most important characters in the world of the play. They have a social dominance that whatever happens to this person, this protagonist, will have a radical effect on every other character in the world of the play. Moving along, let's examine how language works in a tragedy. We've already implied this, but Tragedies deal with intense human emotions. We deal with rage, we deal with grief, we deal with sacrifice. All of these huge, intense things that people feel and do. And that intensity is carried over into the structure of the language in tragedy. And here is another one of the differences between traditional tragedy and modern tragedy. In a traditional tragedy, the play's language is in verse. In a modern tragedy, the language is in prose. And I want to point out, because it took me forever to figure this out myself, verse is a fancy word that means poetry. Prose is another fancy word, but it means everyday language. It's very, very easy for us to mix up the ideas of verse and prose. And for me personally, as a student, for the longest time, I thought verse and prose were the same thing. And they're not. They're exactly opposite each other. Verse is a heightened language. It's poetry where the words have been carefully chosen by the writer 
Everyday language is what I'm speaking right now. I'm trying to get my words in an intelligible order, but the thought process that goes into speaking everyday language or writing everyday language, writing in prose, is very, very different than the thought process we go through when we're writing poetry. Poetry is more mannered. It's more heightened. It's a special form of heightened language. And because tragedies deal with heightened human emotions, it makes sense you might want to have a heightened language form or poetry to communicate those ideas. Enough about language. Let's move along to plot direction. And when I use the phrase plot direction, I'm referring to the kinds of events and situations that happen in these plays. So in a tragedy, we have serious life and death situations. There's no muddy middle ground. People are going to die. And, and we also have the overriding sense from the very, very beginning of the play as audience members, ooh, this is starting out bad and it's going to get worse. Things are definitely not going to turn out okay. So from the very beginning of a tragedy, we have this feeling of dread, this feeling of doom as audience members. And we get this sense from the events that the protagonist finds him or herself in, but we also get a sense of this from the overriding tone of the entire piece. But I want to focus in on a few very important events that the protagonist encounters. In every tragedy, one of the most important points is this fork in the road for the protagonist. The protagonist is already dealing with resolving the major dramatic question, trying to find a way to bring order back into the world. But there's always a point in a tragedy where the character has to make a defining choice. And it's a huge choice because one fork leads to death, but it's the noble path. I am, this is the right thing to do. This is the morally right thing to do. This is the noble thing to do, but I'm probably going to die trying. And the other choice that the protagonist could take will allow the character to survive, but it will probably be the cowardly choice. So the protagonist has a very stark choice to make. So which way does a tragic protagonist go? Our tragic protagonist always makes the noble choice, the morally right choice. But that also means accepting that the character is going to probably die. Think about it. That's a huge choice to make. And this links back into the idea of the protagonist being of noble birth. It's the idea that nobility makes noble, morally correct choices. Of course, we know that people of nobility are mere mortals like the rest of us. But this concept of personal nobility is baked into the very heart of what makes a tragedy a tragedy. Because in the act of making that morally correct choice, we see our protagonist suffer and endure horrible things in the act of sacrificing him or herself for the greater good of the overall society in the play. And how does it all resolve? The inevitable comes to be and our protagonist dies at the climax of the play. I want to point out that this is important. The protagonist doesn't just die any time in the play. The protagonist dies at the climax. If you're looking at any given play and you see a character who dies, that doesn't automatically make that character the protagonist. The protagonist's death 
is how the problem is solved. And another point. You may be thinking of really famous tragedies where the protagonist doesn't die. They manage to survive the entire play. Plays like Oedipus the King or Streetcar Named Desire. Oedipus blinds himself and banishes himself. Blanche goes crazy, but she's still alive. What's up with that? Professor Porter just told me the protagonist has to die at the climax. Sometimes it's not a literal death. Sometimes it is a metaphorical death, a death of sorts. And when we look at Oedipus with him blinded and banished, we realize that everything in his life has now changed in deep and profound ways. He is no longer the king. He is no longer a citizen. He is, he is bound to wander the rest of his life as a nomad. And of course, he cannot see, right? So, so there's been this radical change in his life. He has died in a way. For a character who goes crazy and they literally go around the bend, obviously you see that they're not the same anymore. There has been this radical transformation and nothing is ever going to be the same. So our protagonist wins. Our protagonist solves the problem. Of course, our character dies in the process. And the effect of that is for everyone else in the world of the play, it removes the chaos, it removes the problem, and it establishes order again. At the end of a tragedy, we have a stable world again. So our protagonist dies, yes, but succeeds in solving the problem. Metaphorically, that means the end of a tragedy is a new day. It's a rebirth for that society, a sunrise for that society. In fact, in most tragedies, both on stage and in movies, you will have a literal sunrise in the lighting because we have moved through that very, very dark world of the middle of the night. We have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and we have come out the other side. We have moved back into the light. So through the protagonist's sacrifice, the world has been saved. So if I'm going to take all of this information and put it in a nutshell, I'm going to say that we witness our protagonist's suffering, great suffering and great sacrifice. And in the process, we as audience members experience a catharsis of grief and rage. And that's a new term I'm using here, catharsis. It means you have gotten rid of intense emotions by going through that sacrifice. We have felt our grief, we have felt our rage, and we have gotten rid of them for a while. Tragedies, more than any other genre, give us an intense catharsis. And I want to point out the catharsis we feel by witnessing a tragedy is different from the sense of satisfaction we feel at the end of a comedy or a melodrama. The intensity of the human emotions, the intensity of the sacrifice, the heightened Everything about tragedy leads to a heightened response for us. In fact, at the end of a tragedy, we often feel fabulous. And there's even a name for that. We call it tragic pleasure or tragic joy. And this is one of those paradoxes again. By the end of a tragedy, we have great respect for the dignity of this thing we call being human. We have watched our tragic protagonist do something superhuman, save an entire society, dying in the process, yes, but the society has been saved by one mortal. How amazing is that? Doesn't that mean that me as a mortal, I could do better? I could reach higher. 
Doesn't that mean I have an inherent dignity, an inherent power as a human? We think all of these things as we are experiencing the end of a tragedy. And that means when we're leaving the theater having witnessed a tragedy, we feel light, we feel positive. It doesn't make sense. Like I said, it's paradoxical, but tragedies make us feel fabulous. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, that hasn't happened to me when I left a production of Antigone or when I left a production of Hamlet, it didn't make me feel good. I was I was in eighth grade and and all I thought about was my friends who kept poking me during the entire performance. I didn't feel light and positive. I was bored the whole time. Yes, all of us have those experiences as eighth graders when we're dragged to see a performance of a Shakespeare tragedy. That doesn't necessarily mean that the play didn't work. It may very well mean that you were not a good audience member. And I will admit, I wasn't a great audience member when I was younger either. If we as audience members don't agree to go along for the ride of the play, if we don't agree to engage and hook in to the play itself, then we won't go on the journey of the play and we won't get the benefit of having witnessed the play. And also, because tragedy deals with our internal grief and the rage we feel from having lost the things we've lost, the older we get, the more we lose. The more people we love, we lose. The more jobs we really, really wanted slipped through our fingers. The sweethearts that we thought were the one Oh, it didn't work out. So the older we get, the more life experience we have, the more pain and suffering we experience as human beings, the more personal experience we bring to the theater with us. We bring a bigger box of grief in our hearts with us to the theater. We can have a bigger emotional response when we see a tragedy. I'm not saying young people haven't experienced loss. Please don't think I'm saying that. I'm just saying as we age, we get more and more and more grief. So tragedies can have a more and more and more strong effect on us as audience. You'll notice that one of the things I haven't mentioned is the idea of the tragic flaw. Many of us are introduced to the idea of the tragic flaw in middle school or high school when we're told that the tragic protagonist has something wrong with them. There's, there's a problem somewhere in their central character that causes them to have the problems of their plays. I profoundly disagree with that point of view, and I want to explain what I'm talking about. Yes, it's true. In tragedies, we see the fall of a noble character in the sense that our tragic protagonist dies at the end of the play. But think about what happens before that. Think about how that character came to die. Remember that fork in the road, that noble choice that would eventually lead to death? How, how can our character be deeply flawed if our character is making the morally correct choice? If our character is walking into a situation with eyes wide open, knowing they're going to die, knowing they're walking into a sacrificial situation, how is that a flaw? In fact, if we compare our tragic protagonist to a normal person, a real human being, not a character in a play, our tragic protagonist is amazingly flaw-free. Indeed, by the end of the play, our tragic protagonist has resolved all of the problems and has saved society, has brought about this rebirth of a society. I don't understand how you call that a flawed person. In fact, 
Many people in talking about tragedy look for the moment of apotheosis. It's a fancy word that means the moment when a character goes from being mortal to becoming a god. And just just like in the story of Jesus' rebirth, he goes from being a mortal human and he transcends his mortality and becomes eternal. That beautiful story of, of Easter. Tragic protagonists tend to have those moments of transformation too, as they rise to the challenge of dealing with all of the problems in their world. So again, I don't see a flaw in that scenario. There's another concept we need to talk about as we talk about tragedy, and that's about the concept of fate. In tragedies, everything feels like it's just going to happen that way, that, that there are very few choices involved in a tragedy, that there's nothing a character can do to change the fact that they're fated to die. I want to address that. There's a sense in tragedies that they are a snowball rolling down a hill, that once that snowball starts rolling, there is nothing that's going to stop it. And they tend to unravel as if the events are fated to come to pass, that characters cannot change how this is going to work in their world. And some of this is because the playwright has assembled a causal structure and they've got all of their dominoes lined up. So yes, once you knock over that first domino, each one is going to fall in its own time. And part of this goes back to that fork in the road again. It's a really important domino in the whole play. That moment when the protagonist has to make that choice and our tragic protagonist always makes that noble choice. And once the character makes that choice, the snowball really gets going. So I can understand why there is a sense of events fated to come to pass. It's because our playwright has done the job properly. But I prefer to use the term tragic irretrievability. The idea that there's no turning back for our protagonist, that once that choice is made, nothing can happen to make our protagonist change their mind. And that is tragic irretrievability. Again, fate isn't really a good word to talk about when we're talking about tragedy. So there you go. That's tragedy. Thank you for your attention.